At a pivotal position between the New York School and pop art were the artists Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. And you see them here in a photograph from the early 1950s. Both developed working in the New York School idiom of gestural abstraction, but both will defy their mentors, calling into question whether meaningful subject matter only emanates from the individual or whether instead the artist could become a nexus of information, reorienting what he finds out there, what she finds out there, rather than originating content. So we're talking about reorienting rather than originating. Here's Rauschenberg's Coca-Cola plan from 1958, a great piece. And Rauschenberg talked about working in the gap between art and life, as if the everyday world was rich enough to take in as subject and form. Rauschenberg was all about breaking down the distinctions between so-called high art and low culture. So Coke bottles, low culture, were as lovely to him as the Venus of Samothrace, to which the winged sculpture must refer. The, the Victory of Samothrace is a great classical sculpture in the Louvre, and Coca-Cola plan is making reference to this figurative sculpture. The hierarchical breakdown of subject matter that Rauschenberg employs here is exactly what we will see in pop art. And of course, we saw hints of this with Picasso and Brock's collage, collage cubism. We saw it with some found object work in surrealism, but Rauschenberg's going to push it harder than anyone else before him. Actually, it's interesting that a Coke bottle graced the cover of Time magazine on May 15th, 1950. I show you uh, the image here. This was the very first time an inanimate object replaced the traditional personality portrait. The feature story highlighted Coke as, quote, this is important, listen to this, simpler, sharper evidence than the Marshall Plan or a Voice of America broadcast that the U.S. had gone out into the world to stay, end of quote. So in a sense, the Coke bottle had become a kind of national symbol that Rauschenberg utilizes. And this is not so different from, let's say, Monet's fascination with the newly built train station in the heart of Paris, which we studied a few sessions ago. Both Monet and Rauschenberg, in a sense, are realists, right? Pointing to the immediate world around them as rich source material for their art. So Robert Rauschenberg was born in 1925 in Port Arthur, Texas, actually the same place that Janis Joplin was born. He was christened Milton Rauschenberg after his father, but he would change his name later to Bob. He made his way through the Kansas City Art Institute, then Black Mountain College in North Carolina, which was a wonderful experimental uh, college. And then he studies with uh, Joseph Albers there. And here's a Joseph Albers. So you can see how different they were, really radically different. Although Albers' grid, I think, will be important to Rauschenberg. And you'll see that momentarily. Then Rauschenberg ends up in New York, as all important artists would do. New York was the hub. And we behold now a work from 1953 called Red Painting. And you can see here how in the early 50s, he's definitely practicing his own version of abstract expressionism. Note the field of color, the requisite drips, the all over composition. But there's a hint of his future practice in the newspaper text he used as his base collage material. And you can see it uh, underneath the paint. Rauschenberg was part of the New York scene. He would go to some of their meetings that they would hold. He would go to all the openings. He's copying de Kooning, most importantly. Uh, and he's going to the famous Cedar Tavern, where they would all go and drink copious amounts of liquor. It's interesting to note that Rauschenberg's studio in New York City at the time in the 50s cost him $15 a month. Isn't that amazing? And he lived on a budget of 14 cents a day for food. He couldn't even afford the subway. But he did say, quote, I felt new in New York. I thought the painting that was going on was unbelievable. But there was something about the self-confession and self-confusion of abstract expressionism as though the man and the work were the same 
that personality always put me off because at that time, my focus was in the opposite direction. I was busy trying to find ways where the imagery, the material, and the meaning of the painting would be not an illustration of my will, but more like an unbiased documentation of what I observed. And here's another red painting from 1954. Rauschenberg would begin um, making these paintings by pasting colored comic strips to the canvas. You can't see them because of all the red paint, but this is where he would begin. So as to quote, as he put it, uh, whatever I did would be in addition to something that was already there. Now, scholars suggest that Rauschenberg had seen a large number of Kurt Schwitter's works in the exhibition Dada, 1916 to 1923, held at the Sydney Janus Gallery in 1953, and this made an important impact on Rauschenberg. And you remember Schwitter's very academic, um, crisp collages made from his own diaristic uh, memorabilia. Not long after the red paintings, Rauschenberg does this radical work called Erase de Kooning from 1953. And we're going you know, from rich red painting to very crisp, clean, emptied out uh, Erase de Kooning. And that's very typical for Rauschenberg. He was hugely experimental, uh, would try everything one after another, always surprising us with his uh, technical explorations. So in Erase de Kooning, he wanted to erase a work by a famous abstract expressionist for he said, quote, I was trying both to purge myself of my teaching and at the same time exercise the possibilities. So I was doing monochrome, no image, end of quote. So Rauschenberg needed a drawing already recognized as high art. He goes to de Kooning, who of course agrees to help him. De Kooning loved this idea. And de Kooning then pulls out a really important and difficult work with a surface covered with thick crayon, grease pencil, and ink. Rauschenberg then spent about a month erasing the piece. Then once that was done, he hand lettered the title, the date of the work, and his name, put it on a label, and placed all of this, placed the drawing, placed the label in a gold leaf frame bought specifically for the drawing. Fellow artist Alan Capro read the work as being about, quote, the deeper predicament of modern art which could not provide the utopian solutions to the world's issues which it once promised, end of quote. And, and indeed, th we are on our way to postmodernism with this notion that modernism somehow failed. Now, early on, Rauschenberg and Johns were labeled as neo-Dada, but this is not an appropriate term, for they were not interested in being irreverent. They were not interested really in anti art or being generally naughty. Not really. In this piece, Rauschenberg very authentically wishes to test the erasing quality and test his ability to counter abstract expressionism. So then Rauschenberg meets the experimental composer John Cage and everything changes. Rauschenberg already had strong inclinations toward including everyday materials and John Cage reinforced this tendency. Cage was inspired by Duchamp's ready-mades, as Cage regarded the everyday world as the source of art. He believed that any sound could be a part of music, without hierarchies, without values. Cage worked with found sound. Cage just turned the tape recorder on and let ambient sound determine the work. He let nature make up the composition. A key piece, and one that is illuminating of his practice, is called 4 Minutes 33 Seconds. And it was performed one evening at Carnegie Hall in the 1950s. So imagine this. Let's set the scene. The New York Society shows up at Carnegie Hall to hear the latest avant-garde composer's piece, and everyone's dolled up in their New York finest, and there's this great Steinway piano on the stage. Then the curtain goes up and out comes the pianist in full tuxedo. Everybody applauds. He sits down at the piano. There's a quiet. He lifts his hands and rests them on the keys. But nothing happens. No piano sound. Four minutes go by. That's a really long time, four minutes. After four minutes, he lifts up his hands 
and then sets them back down for another 33 seconds. Again, no sound, no piano. Well, imagine the audience, right? They're whispering, they're coughing, they're shuffling, they're mumbling, you know, why did I spend $100 for this ticket? That kind of thing. Their agitation and confusion was noted in their whispering and their movements, and this was the music, right? The ambient sound that the audience made during the four minutes and 33 seconds, that was a John Cage piece. So Cage was into randomness, indeterminacy, letting nature determine the work. It was a kind of Zen mentality of vanishing into nature, of becoming one with the universe, of denying the self-authorship of work and letting nature take over. Uh, Cage had studied Zen Buddhism at Columbia University with a very famous Zen uh, master, Suzuki was his name. Cage thought, Art should awaken us to the very life we're living. It's it's a great concept, right? Pay attention. Pay attention to what you have. Pay attention to what's around you. Now, here's a photograph of Cage with Rauschenberg on the right and the dancer, Merce Cunningham. The three of them traveled around Europe doing performances, incredible, made up of found movement. Cunningham uh, had a dance company and the dancers would, would take prosaic movement. Cage would do the music using found sound, and then Rauschenberg would make the sets and costumes out of found materials. Often he would go to a particular city, go to the theater, and use just the materials he found on site in the theater, in the basement, in the attic, in the back room, and he'd make sets out of that. Pretty remarkable. So here is a mature Rauschenberg. This is untitled from 1955 made of oil, house paint, paper, fabric, printed reproductions, socks, and a parachute on canvas. And this is a part of the Art Institute collection, a recent gift from uh, the collectors, Gail Neeson and Stefan Edlis, a fabulous collection that's just come to the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm gonna be showing you a lot of work from that collection. So as an analog to Cage's music, perhaps we can think of Rauschenberg's stuff in this composition, the, the, the flotsam and jetsam of his found world, all framed as art. It's a sort of indeterminate, random appreciation of the stuff of his immediate environment. Or is it? For years, our understanding of Rauschenberg was really shaped by Cage's theories. That Rauschenberg's work presents an array of signs and materials to which the viewer is asked to make sense, much like how the viewer navigates through the bombardment of the mass media. But actually, there are more themes, more subtext in Rauschenberg. It is not entirely random. Indeed, the tube sock, and you see it here right next to the parachute as if the foot is going to be kicking the parachute, right? This is, in fact, a coded homosexual icon. Rauschenberg was gay. So the socks actually appear in a number of his works. The tube sock was like a woman's stocking. It was a sexual fetish. Here's Satellite, another great Rauschenberg, and you can see two tube socks in the lower right sort of entwined, embracing one another. So Rauschenberg is engaging in a secreted iconography for those who know the code. His work would take on gay themes in the dangerously repressive 1950s. This is why they're coded or secreted. Rauschenberg used a number of symbols to allude to this gay iconography, not only the tube sock, but neckties and scantily clad athletes from sports magazines all through his work, a way of showing off the male body. Also, back pockets of pants with scarves in them. This all belongs to a host of gay symbols Rauschenberg embedded in the work. Let's look at Rebus of 1955, amazing piece, wonderful work by Rauschenberg, showing us quite clearly his combination of high and low art. Most notable is the Renaissance artist Botticelli's Venus at the top center, 
just next to a comic strip of the same size. It's a perfect statement. He's suggesting all cultural material, high and low, is valid, is valid. And this is an appropriation, great example of appropriation. He's taking a reproduction of the Venus and dropping that reproduction into his painting. He's taking a comic strip out of the newspaper, dropping it into his painting. Appropriation. He's not originating this image. He's just reorienting what's out there. Breaking down hierarchies. This is Rauschenberg's game by including found materials, magazine photographs, high art reproductions. There are even children's drawings in this particular composition. And then paint and fabric. And in fact, the paint has vestiges of abstract expressionism, doesn't it? All of this then arranged in a grid structure out of Joseph Albers, perhaps. This is like a graffitied wall in the media-saturated urban milieu in which he lived. Here's another great Rauschenberg from uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is Bed from 1955. The, the most daring collage we've seen until now, right? He might be looking at Kurt Schwitters, but Schwitters never did this, He's putting his bed onto a canvas. It's upright, it's on the wall, and it was scandalous. Critics talked about vestiges of an axe murder, right? Because of the uh, crazy paint that splashes across the pillow uh, and the quilt. Rauschenberg said, quote, I think of bed as one of the friendliest pictures I've ever painted. My fear has always been that someone would want to climb into it, end of quote. And again, although he claims he used the quilt because he had nothing to paint on one afternoon, so he reaches for this uh, object, and then he puts it in there and he thinks, well, maybe I should add a pillow, and then put all this abstract expressionist hot gestural brushstroke on top of it. Well, I don't think it's that random, actually. I think the piece might also refer to home, to domesticity and to recollections of his mother's quilting bees. He's a young Southern artist in the big city, coming out as a gay man, and this work perhaps brought him the comfort of mom. There will be lots of Paisley prints, actually, in work from this moment, all referring to a homey interior. So, so home becomes a subtext for Rauschenberg. It is expressionistic in that way. Now, the Art Institute has a very important piece titled Short Circuit from 1955. And it, again, it includes that characteristic bric-a-brac of his everyday world. He was like a sponge. He would just grab all of that great New York material that you find uh, in the dumpsters, in the trash that's out on the street in New York City. So in this work, he's grabbing the bric-a-brac of his everyday world and you can see fabric and wood, there's high art reproductions and paint, and then there are two hinged doors, which when you open them, in this next image, you can see the doors open, there's a painting by his first wife, because he was married uh, for a very short time, Susan Weil, and a reproduction of a Jasper Johns flag painting that we're gonna look at uh, in a moment by the artist Sturdevant. Um, the original Johns went missing in 1965. So Rauschenberg started calling his work combines. This is a combine. And he simply did that because he was exhausted by people asking him whether he was making painting or sculptures. Very Greenbergian is that question, right? We talked about that last time, like purity, purity. He starts calling them combines because they're both painting and sculpture. They're not pure at all. All the material here, again, is oriented on his characteristic grid, right? And the appropriated objects, I'm using that word very deliberately, by the other artists were part of his scheme to smuggle his friends into an exhibition in which he was showing. This was very clever, very generous. He was an extremely generous artist. Now, Rauschenberg knew art history. He traveled all over Europe. He was very interested in the history of art. And here is Odalisque from 1955, 58, another combine. 
And we are back to the theme of the reclining nude in art, actually. Let's compare Rauschenberg's Odalisque, note the title, with the Angra, with the Grand Odalisque from 1814. Let's compare the two. Note the similar elbow in the pillow, right? In the Rauschenberg, you've got this uh, wooden uh, furniture piece that is pressing into the pillow at the bottom. Uh, this echoes the Angra's uh, elbow in the, in the pillow. You've got in the Rauschenberg, the uh, main piece, which is a box adorned with many different Rauschenberg images, including quite a few images of naked women. So that corresponds with the naked body of the Angra uh, reclining nude. And then at the top of the Rauschenberg is this rooster, uh, perhaps also referencing Angra's uh, uh, peacock fan. And, you know, he is adorning this uh, homage to the reclining nude with a rooster or a cock, right? So I'll say no more about that. Uh, Rauschenberg is updating the past. He's playing with the tradition of the reclining nude, just as Manet did with his Olympia, right? And Rauschenberg, again, working in the gap between art and life. So he's pulling from popular culture, which the pop artists are going to do, and we're going to see that momentarily, but he's creating a work of art in the tradition of a major trope of art history, the reclining nude. Rauschenberg is working in that gap between art and life. In 1962, Rauschenberg takes a reprieve from the combine technique for print work, such that found images will replace found objects. But it's still very much organized around an aesthetic of reorienting images already out in the world. Here's a great photo of silkscreen tracer that brings together a reproduction of Rubens, Venus at her toilet, juxtaposed with army helicopters. What's this all about? Is he playing passivity and aggressivity, hard and soft, male and female? Hmm, how random is this? I don't think it's very random at all. It's a taxonomy of cultural icons, including the bald eagle below. Again, a kind of 19th century realism using the mass media and art history to speak of the contemporary moment in this fabulous uh, screen print. Here's Crocus from 1962, another juxtaposition of military might and the supplicant nude, war and peace. This time a Velasquez Venus is juxtaposed with an army truck, and then there's this Texas mosquito within this perspectival box and keys dangling at the right. In 1961, Warhol, who we're going to talk about in a minute, had done photo silk screening and showed it to uh, Rauschenberg and to Jasper Johns, and Rauschenberg picks up on this technique. Then in the summer of 1962, Tatyana Grossman persuaded Rauschenberg to try lithography at her Long Island print shop, ULAE, United Limited Arts Edition, and these next two works in the Art Institute's Prints and Drawings collection were the results of his close collaboration with this um, print establishment. So Rauschenberg figured out how to photosensitize a lithostone, and we're looking at Rank from 1964, showing Rauschenberg's classic imagery. There's an art gallery tipped on its side, an appropriation to the left, a baseball game. All culture is good culture, he claims, the gallery and the baseball. And at the lower right, what looks like one of Andy Warhol's flower pieces, that's kind of interesting, and opposite that image is a, a torso holding a gun. So make love, not war, the hippie Rauschenberg proclaims in this piece, perhaps. Rauschenberg is taking images from popular magazines, such as National Geographic, Life, Esquire, boxing and wrestling, and other sports magazines and newspapers. And then he's uh, creating these prints using all of that material. Here's Mark from 1964. Again, he's showing us a bit of Americana with the image of Johnson and then a pole vaulter, perhaps that, again, homosexual secreted iconography, that gay imagery that's hidden in plain sight, but an array uh, of material in the classic uh, Rauschenberg manner. 